Hi, everyone. It's Katie Crysdale here from Lakeview Aquatic Consultants. Thanks so much for being here today. I am thrilled to be able to introduce Kara Wilcox from the Snorkel Safety Study. She's going to be talking today about the work that they've been doing in Hawaii regarding snorkel injuries and deaths and how that's going to contribute meaningfully to water safety and drowning prevention education. So I'm based near Calgary, Alberta. I'm not close to an ocean. I am a pretty weak ocean swimmer. I'm very cautious at the beach. We don't go to ocean very often. And so when we're at the ocean, I'm pretty aware of swimming between the flags near a lifeguard, being very aware of the pull of the tides, uh, rip currents, that sort of thing. But I recognize that not everyone has that same awareness in and around the ocean. And often one of the things that people are most excited to do on vacation is to go snorkeling or um, surface diving in areas where there might be coral or fish or really interesting things to see. And starting here, maybe four or five years ago on the mainland, we started to see these full face snorkels coming to the pool where I was working. It was a municipal pool in southern Alberta. And for no real reason, we started to see these individuals coming in with the full face snorkel mask for lane swim. And I didn't give any thought about it until I started to see these articles coming out of the snorkel safety study discussing the number of injuries and typically fatalities related to these snorkels. And I've been following the snorkel safety study now for several years. They have published articles in EJER, which is the International Journal of Aquatic Research and Education. They have a presence on social media, such as Instagram, on their website. And they've also been mentioned in numerous articles in newspapers and blogs and the statistics are really staggering. So I'm looking forward today to Carol sharing with us how this research came about, what we need to know as aquatic professionals, whether you're a lifeguard, whether you're a pool manager, whether you're just somebody who enjoys being in and around water when you're on holidays. And what do we need to understand about snorkels and what do we need to recognize as the risks? And how can we better educate the layperson, whether it's people in our swim lessons, whether it's our friends and colleagues who are going on vacation to the beach, uh, but what is the impact that the snorkel safety study can have in our awareness about the risks of this specialized equipment? Hi, good morning. Good morning, Katie, and thank you so much for having me on this program. I'm Carol Wilcox, and I am the manager of the Snorkel Safety Study. And my involvement in this was because I actually was a victim of getting in trouble snorkeling about 15 years ago. And what happened, and I'm a good snorkeler, I'm an experienced swimmer, I live in Hawaii, I've been doing this all my life. Um, I got into the water and started snorkeling out in the ocean, and it was a little choppy. And I got, oh, maybe a couple of hundred yards out, if that, and lost my breath. I became short of breath. I was very weak and my legs were sinking. And so I, I swam over to a reef and held on, but I couldn't hold on. I wasn't strong enough. And there was no one around to help me. I was in really big trouble. And this was about five or 10 minutes after being in the water. So I made towards shore, and as I got closer to shore, I became weaker and weaker. And by the time I got to the shore, I, I lost consciousness. I was rescued and taken to the hospital. And the diagnosis was pulmonary edema, which is a filling of the lungs. And it wasn't because I aspirated water, it was because my bodily fluids had gone into my lungs. Had I died, it would have been considered by a heart attack, heart failure. So anyway, I have a good friend, Dr. Phil Fodi, who's a pulmonologist, a lung specialist. And so I saw Dr. Fodi and I said, Dr. Fodi, I think it's the snorkel that did this. And he said, oh yeah, of course it was the snorkel. And so I was surprised. I was just taking that out of the air. 15 years later, more people were drowning while snorkeling. And the Department of Health in Hawaii had a committee to look into this. And I was put on this committee. 
as sort of the poster child of, of this kind of event. That was about three years ago, and we have now completed the snorkel safety study. So the purpose of the study was to identify the causes of getting into trouble while snorkeling and to develop messages to help save lives. So I'd like to share a really important um, graph put out by the Department of Health called Ocean Drowning in Hawaii. So this graph, as you can see, the snorkeling deaths by non-residents far outnumber all the other deaths put together. And there's very few residential deaths, residential snorkeling deaths, yet there are Res more residents dying of other events like boating and kayaking and you know fishing and these other things or the same amount. So this is an anomaly that's very, very disturbing and, and mysterious. One of the characteristics of a snorkel, of a typical snorkel death is that it's very quiet. People just are motionless and then they're found to be unresponsive and they're dead. So the accepted wisdom is that it, the tourists have poor swimming ability and poor snorkeling ability, and then they get injured or they panic or they have a heart attack, you know, or, or it's the ocean conditions. So we wanted to see which of these causes were, were the most typical. But another possible factor was this pulmonary edema that had occurred to me. And the reasons for considering this a factor was because of the mysterious nature of the snorkel drownings, that there was very little warning, there was no signs of distress, and also documented cases of pulmonary edema. Um, I was the first one that's been documented, but there have been others since. And also there's cases where people are known to be competent swimmers and snorkelers. Drowning by aspiration, which is what we usually think of when drowning, and drowning by pulmonary edema are entirely different things. We're all kind of familiar with drowning by aspiration. You're submerged in the water, you struggle to get up and to get air, and when you can't help it anymore, you aspirate water into your lungs, and you have hypoxia, which is a lack of oxygen, and, and die. And it's, it's a, a very um, invasive, struggling, lots of action sort of, sort of event. Drowning by pulmonary edema or rapid onset pulmonary edema is entirely different. You, your lungs fill up and you don't notice it until you have become partially hypoxic. You, your oxygen is reducing. And very quickly at that point, you lose your neuromuscular function as happened to me. You lose consciousness and you die. And at that point at death, you very likely might aspirate. And so in the autopsy, it looks like a drowning and it looks like a heart attack from drowning. So this is what we were looking at is, is how much does rapid onset pulmonary edema play into, into these issues. So we have, the study is in five parts. The first part was to test snorkels for resistance. So we looked at all different kinds of snorkels and including the full face mask, which is very popular. When we started the study, the full face mask had just become very, very popular and was being faulted for a lot of these drownings. However, I must point out that these drownings were happening long before the full face mask. So we tested 50 snorkels and determined there was this wide, wide range of resistance between snorkels and that the general rule is the simpler the snorkel, probably the safer it is. Um, but you really couldn't tell too much by, by looking at a snorkel, whether it was going to be safe or not. So that was one part. We tested snorkels for resistance. The, the principal investigator of the study is Dr. Phil Foti, and he did that. He also examined the medical examiner records of all drowning victims, which were not very helpful. Um, the thing that we got from that mostly was the connection between certain heart dysfunction and, and getting into trouble. And Dr. Foti also did personal interviews with those who had gotten in trouble. He reviewed the medical records of those who had gotten in trouble. And then finally, there was a survey 
of those who had gotten into trouble snorkeling. And this was my part of the study. What we hypothesized was that we didn't know what was going on with these people who were drowning because of course they had drowned, but there were so many people who had survived and they were the ones who could tell us what had happened to them. And as I mentioned before, you have this series of symptoms or events leading up to, you know, drowning by aspiration or drowning by pulmonary edema. So how, they're, how they got into trouble, what happened first, second, and third is extremely important to make a distinction between these two ways of drowning. Um, and I just wanna throw in here that we look at drowning as, as a process. So typically if you say you drowned, that suggests that it was fatal However, drowning is a process which doesn't always have to lead, lead to fatality. We, ha we had the survey and the survey asked all of the questions that might, might tease out whether uh, you're a good swimmer or not, whether you have health conditions, how much you've been snorkeling, what the ocean conditions were and so on and so forth. And if anybody wants to go online and look at that survey to see what's in it, you can do that we did determine that snorkel-induced rapid onset pulmonary edema is a common factor in snorkel-related drownings and near drownings. In fact, in our study, I think it was 85% of the events were, were related to snorkel-induced rapid onset pulmonary edema. And we identified the risk factors. So the degree of the snorkel resistance to inhalation is, was a major factor. Certain pre-existing medical conditions are also a major factor. And that tends to happen to men, women and men, but more men that are 50 years and older. So that population is a little more at risk. And also while you're out there, the increased exertion. So when people get a little anxious, let's say they've, they've gone beyond where they wanted to be or suddenly they can't touch and they increase their exertion, this will increase the rapidity of the pulmonary edema. So what the survey found that was that aspiration was rarely the trigger or even a factor in near drowning incidences. And that lack of swimming or snorkeling experience was rarely a factor. And almost all events took place where the person could not touch bottom. And 38%, so we didn't see, we didn't have enough full, full face masks to test to see if they intrinsically provided more resistance. And actually one of our full face masks tested better than all of the masks. So it's not intrinsic into the full face mask, but there are a number of other problems with full face masks. And interestingly enough, 90% of those who wore a full face mask considered it a major factor or a contributing factor to their trouble. That is in brief, our study and, and what, we, what we found. Um, and we have all the details online on snorkelsafetystudy.com. Do you have any questions, Katie? Thank you so much for that information, Carol. I have a couple of questions. So um, all of this is so interesting for someone. I'm, I live on the mainland. I don't live close to an ocean. My experience is seeing a lot of vehicles in pools. And I really appreciated what you said about the full face mask is not, uh, you know, it's not necessarily the worst or the only, um, the only player in this incident. Um, can you talk a little bit about your personal experience? Have you gone back to snorkeling? Is it something that you, you know, you now find other ways to make sure that it's safe or where you swim or how you do it? Oh, thank you for asking that. Yes, snorkeling is one of my most favorite things in the world to do. And I took up photographing while snorkeling recently. And I have gone out probably three or four times a week during COVID, it's been my great pleasure. I only snorkel where I can stand. So, and almost all of the really good reef things are within, you know, six feet uh, of, the, of the water surface. And so I can keep myself really, really entertained um, that way. 
so yes, I continue to snorkel, but I'm really very, very careful. And, uh, and I, I have had a second incident like that uh, when I didn't listen to all of my rules, so my own personal rules, so I'm very cautious. Definitely speaking from my own personal experience, I have limited snorkeling experience and it's only been when I've been on vacation. So I was that person, you know, who flew from the mainland to Hawaii and I snorkeled because it was the thing to do, whether I was equipped or not. But it's interesting because when I took my my paddy underwater scuba diving course a few years ago, I had always understood and I have no idea where I got this thinking but I thought you were supposed to snorkel out with the snorkel in your mouth to get used to the restricted airflow. And when I took my scuba course, the instructor said, no, 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 no. You never put an obstruction in your mouth and you can swim freely in the waves. There might be boats around. You need to look where you're going. You only put the snorkel in over the site that you are snorkeling. And I always have tried to wonder now, where did I get this thinking that I should get used to the snorkel and somehow restrict breathing as I'm actively engaging in exercise quite a distance to get to the destination? Yeah, I don't know where you got that idea. But the other idea that happens with, with scuba is that you have to wait a day or two. Remember, if you've been flying, mm -hmm. then you, there's a certain time period where you wait. And that is, that is one of the suggestions that we make too as relative to snorkeling is if you have just had a recent prolonged air trip, uh, you might want to wait a day or two or three. And, and the other uh, recommendation we would have now is do not exercise while snorkeling. Don't exercise mm -hmm. with a snorkel. And uh, you know, so I know a lot of people do that in pools, but Unfortunately, the, the common thinking for many, many years was hypoxic training, lung busters, any sort of restriction. I think there's better education now about shallow water blackout and what that looks like to suppress the body's desire to breathe. But I appreciated where you were making graphics. There's a range of snorkels and some of them have little caps to prevent splash in or they have other restrictions that complicate an already quite small opening, right? So I, I think that's an interesting piece for people to consider that maybe you won't get water in your mouth, but then you're actually restricting your airflow more than you need to. That's exactly right. You're, you're spot on on that. When I got into trouble the first time, it, I had one of those balls up there in the, in the snorkel that, that lifted up when you went underwater to keep water from coming in. All of that very likely provides a constriction to the opening. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of the things we were seeing in the pools, uh, so about five years ago, we were also starting to see those full face masks, very popular. I, I don't know why, but they just became a trend very quickly. And one of the difficulties for us in the pool setting was they became very popular with individuals that had not yet mastered water in the face, like the sensory, how to clear your face, clear eyes. And so right. this was their workaround to keep their face dry. And I would imagine too, in a lot of these injuries or fatalities, people may have gotten into trouble by getting leaks through the snorkel or the mask, and then not being comfortable figuring out how to deal with all of these things going on in the middle of the ocean without being able to put their feet down. It's a contribution of the mask, but it's, it may also be a water competency issue. That's right. And 100% of the people who got in trouble were unable to stand, unable to touch bottom. So you've nailed that exactly right. So talk to us about, um, in your experience, living in Hawaii and, and the tourists that come, you know, I was a tourist once and you roll up to the beach and there's people who can rent you equipment or there's different types of equipment available, maybe at stores or shops or hotels. What would you say should the average competent swimmer be trying snorkeling or what, what are the steps we should take before jumping in to go and see those, those reefs or those fish or those beautiful sites? You know, your standard swim with a buddy is, is still your number one recommendation. But anybody who snorkels knows that what you do really quickly is, is separate from your buddy because you're looking at this fish and that person's looking at that fish and you become separated very quickly. And it's a very quiet thing. When you're looking at something, you're very still and quiet. And so we found that, that buddies were not usually the first person that helped out. Mm. That you, you do want to swim with a buddy, but it's not, they don't rely on them. 
And if you can't swim, don't snorkel. That's just as you pointed out, there's a lot going on with the snorkel. So if you're not a confident swimmer, don't, don't try to snorkel. And as we discussed, you wanna pick your equipment carefully. Check the mouthpiece to see if it's constricted. Try to keep it relatively simple. And most importantly, if you can stand, if you can touch the bottom, you're, you're probably going to be fine. You can, you can take your mask off, you can stand up and just the very act of standing up takes pressure off of your chest and will we'll start to reverse that edema process. And if you have heart problems, you want to be particularly cautious. If you have just come to Hawaii, I would recommend not swimming for a day, not snorkeling. You can swim, but don't snorkel for a day or two. Uh, and you're quite right. It's very typical to get picked up at the airport and then taken to a place to swim while you're, while you're if you come in in the early morning while your room is, is being readied. A good portion of our people who got into trouble, the survey people, drifted away from home base, whether they were from a boat or shore or whatever, and then found themselves maybe in a little waves or too far away and started to, to uh, become a little more anxious and that just made matters worse. So really check your location constantly. And if you feel short of breath, that is a very bad sign. So if you're short of breath, um, take precautions right away. Uh, try to take your snorkel off. If you can't touch, get on your back and float. If you can call for help, do get to get to shore. Those those are the big those are the big safety measures. And don't exercise with with snorkel equipment. That's Has it. Has this information been received in in your community or with tour operators? Is it welcome, or are people um, upset about these this information? Tour operators have almost universally no longer use full face masks. That the problem with them has become apparent and they just can't take the risk. We've just finished our study and I don't know whether it's going to be widely accepted or not. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to get your mind around what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's really, really hard to think of this rapid onset pulmonary edema. It's been, it's been associated with long distance swimming, with uh, altitude, you know, alpine climbers and all that kind of stuff. That's all the same, same event, pulmonary edema, but it being rapid and it's never been associated with snorkeling before. So this, it's gonna take some time to have this sink in. What, what I'm hoping will happen though, is that as it, as it becomes, as other science accepts this and tests it and verifies it, that the snorkel industry manufacturers will, will produce low resistance snorkels. That will be a big help. Well, and I think it can all, it can all help the industry. I think initially sometimes these manufacturers, they, they fear any changes, they fear any news because, you know, drowning will lead to lower sales, but it really, snorkeling can be safe. It just requires a little bit of education, like your study has been providing to show the statistics and, and even just as orientation process, whether it's with the tour operators, whether it's with certain sites, um, it, it doesn't have to be complicated, a simple education message, a pamphlet, something like that could go a long way. I think it's just, it's highly unregulated, speaking for the land side, where what right. we see at stores, whether it's a Costco or, you know, a, a Walmart, it, it, the products are unregulated and they don't have the, the most up-to-date research or information about how people are using them. Right. You know, essentially, when you, let's go look at that, at that first graph again. When you look at it, it is a pretty safe sport for residents. So it's this issue about visitors that is really perplexing. And we were not able to, we tried, but we were not able to make a connection between time traveled and the event. That's going to take more science and you know, beyond our capacity. So at this point, it's just a hypothesis, but I can't think of any, any other reason why these statistics would be what they are. Oh, and then I have to point out that we were unable to get visitors from Asia side to, to answer this because most of our survey was taken during COVID. So we had very few visitors. So 
the survey didn't, you know, didn't reveal much either. I think the air travel is a really interesting piece, but like you said, you could dive down very granular into looking at, you know, or having to wonder as variables, you know, the athletic abilities of individuals who are coming, people who choose to tourist Hawaii versus other locations. Are they naturally predisposed to more of an outdoors and active holiday or are they, you know, there's so many variables that go into it even before you layer on air travel. And then I know myself right. with overnight flights, exhaustion, dehydration, poor nutrition, or, you know, other factors that would, right. that would limit someone's physical abilities in the, in, in the short term anyway. Right. So it's hypothetical right now, but it's, a, but it's a good hypothesis. <laughs> No, I think it makes complete sense to me, even right. as someone who, who used to fly a lot, right? It's a yeah, long flight right. to Hawaii. <laughs> right, right. And, you know, if your ankles swell up, that means, you know, you're a little, you have some edema established in your body already. Thank you so much, Carol. Do you have any final thoughts on this project or what you've learned in this process? Well, thank you, Katie. No, I think we're done. If you, if you have more questions and and thank you for the opportunity. No, I think that was great. I think uh, I would have honestly never have considered the air travel piece. And that's just like bouncing around my brain now because it makes right. so much sense, Definitely. right? To even correlate. So from Calgary to Oahu, I think it's like 5.5 hours. It's not that bad, but from Toronto, it's like almost nine hours, right? So if you could even geographically start to isolate groupings and yeah, you could go on forever probably. <laughs> well, and, and when I had my incident, I was, I had just come back from Canada the day mm. before and mm. I was very tired and I thought, well, I'll go take a swim to perk and me fresh and, Yeah. I, I've yeah. done that too. Yep. Right. And I wasn't yeah. snorkeling. I was, I was swimming. I was mm. swimming out with the snorkel, swimming out to, to a marker. So I was doing everything wrong. And I, I wasn't snorkeling looking for fish. I was going someplace and coming back. Yeah. No, but it all applies. I mean, we struggle when we teach swimming lessons in the pool. We hear a lot of parents they register their children because they'll say pre-COVID, like, oh, we're we're going to Oahu in six months. I want them to be safe. And it and try and explain to the parents we can teach swimming in a box. That's not the same as swimming with waves or swimming with rip tides, you know, like heaven help you if you think that the ability to swim in a box is going to be exactly the same in salty water. I mean, I'm a very strong swimmer and I'm very nervous around the ocean because I've only been to the ocean maybe 10 times in my life, right? So I'm right. ultra right. cautious because right. I'm used to boxes or, or flat lakes, right? Freshwater right. lakes. Well, and here's the other thing is this doesn't happen to children. Interesting. Yes. Well, they, children, you know, do like snorkels, mm -hmm. but they basically like masks and they like to yes. jump up and take a breath of air. And, you know, the snorkel usually goes the way of the other way, mm -hmm. but um, kids don't just, they're, they're too active. They don't just sit and, and breathe through a snorkel the way we do for a long well, time. Well, nose piece too. I'm sure most of the masks you had probably had the closed nose, but I know that was something brought up by my scuba instructor at the time was, you know, learning to not exhale so much through your nose changes your breathing when you're submerged and yes. you have to learn that right yes and and if you just have a simple snorkel you can when water gets in it you blow really hard to get that water out and that's good exercise for your lungs so but people don't like that that they have the water come in there and that scares them well, and it's the, the stopping what you're doing, the getting upright, which can be very good to stop and see that you haven't landed away from your location, because that is in drowning, you know, when we teach in pools anyway, is you need to orient where you are, because you could end up getting into the middle of the lake and have no way to get back to land because you haven't brought your head up in 10 minutes. And how the water's moving you, the currents is also quite dangerous. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, I so appreciate your time. It'll take me a weeks to edit this but I'll send you a link when it's up and I, I think that what the work you guys are doing is so needed I, I was guilty myself of blaming the full face masks initially because in the pool we found that big strap was the big issue with kids couldn't rip them off right. they were panicking but it yeah. does sound like it's a far more nuanced issue I, I do have a thing that I forgot to say even though our sure. study is complete we are going to continue to collect 
surveys till the end of this year oh, so that we have a larger you know larger database so if anybody has gotten into trouble please encourage them to mm -hmm. take the survey and it's just on the website i'm thinking it's on the website yep okay all right well thank you so much for your time carol we'll we'll speak again soon when this is done thank you katie yeah have a great day aloha